welcome. Uh, we're going to get started. I am Daniela Bleichner. I am the director of the Levan Institute for the Humanities. Uh, welcome to one of our monthly how-to uh, conversations. Today we have joining uh, us to talk about model for collaboration in the humanities and humanistic social sciences, three colleagues from USC. Uh, Mike Anani, uh, professor, Associate Professor of Communication and Journalism, Andrew Lakoff, Professor of Sociology and Communication, and Lydie Mudileno, uh, Fra uh, Marion Francis Chevalier, Professor of French and Professor of American Studies and Ethnicity. I do ask that if at all possible you turn on your camera. These are very casual conversations and it really makes a difference uh, to uh, the experience if we are present uh, as uh, moving heads, not frozen heads or blank names. Um, the format for these conversations is uh, quite straightforward. We ask each of our invited speakers to talk very briefly, about eight minutes absolutely maximum, and I will enforce that ruthlessly. Um, about uh, their thoughts uh, for uh, people uh, um, contemplating uh, collaboration in the humanities and humanistic social sciences. And then we will have about half an hour for uh, questions uh, from uh, the, anyone here. Um, and uh, I will moderate. And if you have questions, please use uh, the yellow hand or the whatever color it is hand and the reactions that will allow me to see you. Uh, so uh, thank you. And uh, we normally go uh, in alphabetical order. So Mike, that means you are first. All righty. Thank you very much for the, the invitation to be here. It's a treat and it's lovely to see so many familiar faces that I that I see in other Zoom, um, Zoom rooms. So thanks very much uh, for here. Um, I'll be, uh, be brief in the remarks and hopefully we can just sort of surface things through conversation. Um, I, I come to this conversation with a background and sort of a history and being in academia that has been very interdisciplinary and collaborative in a lot of different ways, whether that's through, you know, formal degree programs that I've done or different projects or different um, publishing efforts. So I sort of, for me, collaboration and interdisciplinarity are sort of very, very natural things that are almost impossible uh, not to do. Um, and I also come to this from a perspective of being a, you know, professor of communication, which is also um, for the graduate students in the room who know sometimes a difficult field to sort of define or to bound and that um, that porousness to the field, I think is one of its strengths, but it can also create sort of moments of, of collision or interaction where you sort of ask, you know, what exactly does it mean to be a professor of communication or getting your PhD in communication? Um, and then the third sort of bit that I sort of bring to this conversation as well is I, a lot of the questions um, and debates that I'm really interested in are interdisciplinary. Like I just, I find it almost impossible not to do the type of collaboration and interdisciplinarity that I think we're gonna talk about today um, because the questions kind of demand it. And that's that's sort of the, where the work has taken, taken me. Um, uh, the, uh, Danielle asks us to uh, sort of, again, be brief, but to offer maybe sort of a few high level touch points um, that we could put on the table for conversation. And in thinking about it, there were three that sort of stood out for me um, in how to think about collaboration in the humanities and the humanistic social sciences. And I, I think of myself a little more in sort of the humanistic social sciences uh, part of the spectrum. But the, the first is that um, when I've been part of collaborations that I think have gone well or that have been generative, um, I think they're usually centered around shared objects or shared concerns. And those can be objects of study or field sites or events or particular stakes or communities or, but there's sort of a reason that people come together. And that doesn't have, not everybody has to have the same reason for getting there, but it means that there's a shared object or a shared sort of um, site that brings that mutuality together. And I think it's helpful sometimes to just remember the reasons you got into the collaboration to begin with and to literally write those down sometimes and, and, and share them and be explicit about them because they can become good touchstones later on in the project where 
things get fuzzier and more chaotic maybe. And people are like, wait a second, why are we working together at all? What are we doing? And it can be a way to sort of reground in a, in a shared object. So I would just say that's one thing that I found helpful is to, uh, to know what's grounding the collaboration to begin with. Um, the other thing I think about sometimes, the second thing is I, I try as much as possible to take sort of a pragmatist perspective on definitions and boundaries. And because often people, you know, I've been in, in collaborations where somebody says, well, that's not what technology is, or that's not what public means, or, you know, that's not the kind of communication that matters or something. So what I would do is instead of getting into sort of you know, contests and fights about what technology really is or what community really means or these sort of reductive moves is to actually um, ask what's at stake in defining that object of study or that thing in a particular way and put those on the table and be explicit about them and say, we're not, we're not in the business of trying to collapse and reduce that complexity, but surface it and say, what do you think's at stake by um, by uh, defining that word in that way or defining that stake in that way. Because I think those can actually become kind of the building blocks um, of the project is once you surface those, uh, those differences and sort of make them complementary lenses. Um, so that's if, if the first one is sort of identify your shared objects, know why you're in the collaboration. The second is sort of take this pragmatic view um, and ask what's at stake in a definition versus another definition. The third that comes to mind for me um, is sort of about the mechanics of collaboration. And sometimes I think um, I've been in projects where those mechanics have sort of um, been left implicit or have been left uh, unspoken. And what I mean by mechanics of the collaboration are kind of some you know nuts and bolts kind of things. Like different people have different roles in a project. Like some projects will say, we are, we are equitable contributors and we want to sort of try to maintain and strive for that equality throughout um, the project, other collaborations may have um, an explicit sort of strong leader figure who's like, yes, the leader is responsible for the scope and the shape, and then there's other people who are providing more supporting roles. That's fine too. Um, other, honestly, other people, some people have more or less time to contribute to a collaboration. And that sounds like a mundane thing to say in a way, but especially in these roles where we're like, we're dragged in different directions and no single person knows what everybody else is doing. That's kind of a, you know, there's no, there's no one person who knows it all is being explicit about saying, yeah, you know, I, I could participate in this, but it's not my central thing. It's a side project for me, or it's a side and just say that be really explicit. Um, there's also things like different career roles. People are at different stages of careers where they maybe need to or want to, you know, publish in this venue versus another venue, or some people are more interested in, you know, public facing types of uh, work and that's important for them at that point. Um, some people need to move faster or slower. Um, so I would just say sort of putting all those on the table when I've been part of those collaborations where we literally, you know, put on the table and say like, who wants to be first author? <laughs> and in some fields, that question matters a ton. In other fields and other career stages, you might say, I don't care. It's not a big deal for me. And I don't, you know, or you may discover in the shape of a project, actually, we have two projects here and you lead on that one and I lead on this one. And then we're going to sort of, you know, you be first author and leader and I'll be first author and leader. Um, or also more in sort of, you know, medical, I think sciences, you know, it matters, you know, who's not only who's first author, but who's last author. And those are signals that matter in different fields. And then to other fields, they don't matter at all. Um, so just being explicit about sort of who you want to be in communication with through the collaboration, um, I think can be a way of um, kind of diffusing things that, because down the road, you don't, I don't, I, you don't want to get into this thing of like, wait a second, I thought I was first author because this thing is actually key to my career move and I need this thing out in the next nine months. And someone's like, whoa, hold on, you know, I wanted something different. Um, so just avoiding those sort of pitfalls um, of collaboration. So, so I had to say like shared objects, know what you're working on together, make differences, uh, a prag take a pragmatic turn and ask what's at stake in differences, and then just being explicit about uh, the mechanics. Those are the, the sort of the three things that came to mind. Um, and I'm at seven minutes and 27 seconds, Daniela. So I think I got it under, okay. Thank you, wonderful. Um, Andy, you're next. 
Okay, I'm going to say a couple of things that actually resonate with what Mike said. Um, I came from a discipline that cultural anthropology, um, in which the traditional research model is that of the, the solo ethnographer in a, in a small circumscribed community um, doing research on his or her own, leading to a single authored monograph. Um, and as I sort of was in training, the core object of the field was transforming to more complex, large scale objects, transnational flows, tr uh, cosmopolitan science. And I think um, anthropologists in my generation became frustrated with this single authored model and began to experiment with forms of collaboration, but really bumping against very much established norms. So collaboration has really been central to my intellectual trajectory, but it has also been a challenge. Um, and I also come to this question, uh, having served for a few years in administration as divisional dean of the social sciences and really observing how in different fields there are different norms around collaboration and that think, as Mike said, thinking about collaboration in terms of where you are in your career tra trajectory is really important. Um, let me start with a kind of quick and easy distinction between two kinds of collaboration that I've been engaged in. Um, I'll call one of them thin uh, and one of them thick. Um, and, and so by thin collaboration, I mean, you know, you might have some shared ideas and approaches that bring a group together, um, but the actual research and writing is still done on one's own. And so I think of conferences and workshops that might lead to an edited volume or to a special issue of a journal. Um, and doing something like this makes a lot of sense if you're excited about establishing a new subfield um, or you see that there's a novel approach emerging across fields to an existing question. Um, it's also really good, especially at an early stage for fostering scholarly networks, setting intellectual agendas um, and getting feedback from the other participants on your own work. So it has a lot to recommend it. Um, I would also say that it doesn't necessarily have a huge intellectual payoff because oftentimes these collected volumes remain a set of single authored pieces that are easily disaggregated uh, from the overall piece. And, and there isn't that necessarily that much um, inter mutual influence among the pieces. Um, there are some models uh, that actually push against this kind of continued individualization of research within, let's say, a, a collected volume. I, I think of um, long-term working groups in which people you know, regularly share, um, share drafts and, and gradually put together an edited volume that really shows the influence of all the members of the group. Um, also, you might have a magazine, a, a journal or a magazine in which, and, and there's one that I participate in, participate in that I can say more about in which the, the editors really push hard to get the authors to, to, to engage very closely with one another in a given issue. Um, let me say a little bit about thicker models of collaboration. And by that, I mean, when you actually do research collaboratively and you write collaboratively and it results in a co-authored article or even a co-authored book. And, and as you may know, um, co-authored books in the humanistic social sciences and the humanities are actually pretty rare, interestingly. I mean, there are some significant exceptions, um, but in, and there are reasons why they're rare in terms of the style of thought we're used to and our mode of work. Um, I do think there are some potential big payoffs. They can lead to unique um, contributions if there are complementary forms of expertise among the, ex among the authors, um, but at the same time, some shared basic intellectual assumptions. And it's also having, having done this in, in a project that took over a decade, um, I will say that it can be really nice to have an ongoing interlocutor and co-discoverer, um, given how isolated single authored research and writing can be. Um, but there are some downsides and some reasons to be wary of entering into this kind of thick collaboration, especially at, I think, an early career stage. Um, it, can be, it can actually be slower, a lot slower to write collaboratively than to write individually um, and hard going. And for the outside world, for your colleagues, for administrators, these projects often raise questions of credit. Um, it can be hard for colleagues to understand who did what in a project. And it's also really hard to establish a scholarly reputation based on a collaborative project. Um, and the last thing, I think there's a danger, there, there's a potential danger of insularity. If, if the project gets too, sort of too intensely collaborative, um, it becomes enclosed in a mutually reinforcing set of questions. Um, so I think if you're going to enter into thick collaboration, it's better to start small, like with an article. Um, one should be attentive to power dynamics if there are different career stages, as Mike noted, uh, in a given collaboration. Um, and it's important to keep going a strong individual research and writing trajectory while you're also doing this collaboration. Um, let me close with a couple of quick thoughts from the perspective of having been 
an administrator um, and having been involved in hiring tenure and promotion cases as a divisional dean in the social sciences. Um, first, it's important to distinguish between the intellectual value of a, of a piece of scholarship and its administrative value. And often something can be very valuable, valuable intellectually, um, but not valued administratively. And I'll give an example of editing a collected volume of which I've done three. Um, it can be very intellectually enriching and potentially significant. Um, but administrators and, and uh, committees assessing a dossier will, will almost completely discount a collected volume. So you have to keep that in mind if you're going to enter into this. Um, in terms of thick collaborations, there are some disciplines in which, like communication, as Mike said, in which joint research and writing is quite common. It's very true of the quantitative social sciences, sociology, and political science. Um, but these fields have established clear ways of laying out who did what in terms of research analysis or original ideas so that a given evaluation committee can understand how to, how to weigh the, the contribution of the person that's being evaluated. Um, so if you're at, at an early stage of your career, it's really important um, to be able to explain as you put together, for example, a tenure dossier, exactly what your contribution was to this and committees are gonna be very attentive to that. Um, I would say for that for junior scholars in the humanistic social sciences, um, I would tend to shy away from really thick long-term collaborations um, to establish your, your scholarly reputation early on. It's, bet, it's probably better to enter into this at a later career stage. Um, and even for, for more senior scholars, it's still going to be really important to be able to clarify what your individual contribution is. Um, and you may, be able, you may have to be okay with getting less administrative credit, even though you've actually done more work. Um, you may not be able to get promoted on the basis of this thick collaboration. Um, Seven minutes, I think. So I'm done. My turn. OK, so um, happy to be here. Thank you, uh, Daniela, for proposing this wonderful topic. Uh, I'm really thankful uh, for this workshop because uh, really uh, it allows us to uh, to rethink some of the assumptions on what collaboration uh, collaboration is, I'm going to share some uh, some uh, some remarks um, because I am alas I'm going to repeat some of what my uh, my two colleagues have uh, said, but it's not only going to confirm that uh, that they there are some really salient points. Um, the assumption is that uh, collaboration is a rare thing in the humanities, uh, or at least that it's not as uh, widespread or as valued or as uh, efficient as in other uh, sciences, and there are all sorts of reasons why that might be true. But I think it is uh, worth taking a different standpoint and uh, reclaiming or claiming the relevance and the power of those uh, specific forms of uh, collabor collaborative work in the humanities. So. In the next uh, few minutes, I'll ground my remarks in my own practice as a scholar who has co-authored uh, books and co-edited uh, volumes, as a professor who has co-taught interdisciplinary seminars, and as someone with experience of over two decades, uh, sitting on all sorts of committees, evaluating uh, dossiers from fellowships to tenure to promotion, job applications, etc. in my discipline, uh, modern languages and Africana studies, but also um, outside. So um, at first, it, 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 it seems indeed that our models and our modes of uh, collaboration are not as spectacular as in other disciplines. But in fact, when you take a closer look, there's a multitude of ways in which uh, we in the humanities do collaborative uh, work, either because we're asked to collaborate at a point or because we actually initiate those uh, activities. So to begin on this kind of different, less uh, different uh, note, I'd like to um, affirm actually a long-standing tradition of uh, collaborative work in the humanities. I want to reclaim these as legitimate and creative and generative activities. Um, I can, this is kind of like uh, echoing uh, the, the, the distinction that, uh, that Andrew just established between the thin and the thick. I, I, I think those fall in two categories that I have called the obvious and the invisible. So in the obvious ones, uh, I, I, I put the ones that are getting increasingly uh, more uh, value and, and credit. This would be co-authoring, uh, co-editing, 
or working with one or several colleagues on a, on a, on a funded project such as digital humanities projects, etc. But then in the more invisible kind of uh, teamwork and collaboration, I really want to include all the things that we do on a regular basis, like, and again, you alluded to them putting together sessions, panels at uh, national and, and international meetings, contributing to encyclopedia entries, co-teaching, translating, participating in workshops, doing what the university calls a uh, survey, which involves, uh, which involves uh, committees, task forces, uh, et cetera, and uh, all sorts of uh, collaborative work that uh, we should really uh, redefine with an eye not only to the actual uh, process of, uh, to the, not only with an eye to the, to the material outcome of the collaboration, but to the actual process of working uh, together and advancing our discipline. Because I think, and that's also what Mike said, that this is the reality of how we operate. This is the reality of how we work, uh, meaning that we reach outside our, our so-called siloed uh, departments and disciplines uh, all the time. And I think that this multi-sided collaboration is actually a reflection of what being an academic uh, and being a researcher means, regardless of uh, disciplines. More importantly, these also um, items that I listed are also items on our academic uh, CVs, uh, regardless of rank, but rank actually uh, plays a very uh, uh, essential uh, part. And their values on our CVs need to be interrogated. They need to be recast all the time, as much as the more obvious uh, items in this uh, category. So in the spirit of this workshop, I, I, I thought I would uh, very quickly uh, go into a, a how-to, and I prepared something that, that I could call how to prepare for collaborative uh, work, the, the assessing both the risks and the benefits of, of, of uh, cooperation. The benefits are easy to imagine. Uh, you, know, you can think about the attraction of interdisciplinarity, the complementarity of approaches, interaction with nice colleagues, uh, uh, contributing different expertises, reciprocal uh, motivation to pursue the project, the intellectual fueling of ideas, a change of pace, a change of the solitude of the ivory tower, a solution to procrastination, etc. So in other words, it's almost, uh, and most of the time, it's a good, uh, it's a good idea. But I think that we, we, and especially, uh, as Andy said, young colleagues uh, need to, to, to keep in mind that we need, to, we need to get ready, we need to know what we are getting into. So I have five uh, quick recommendations uh, in, uh, that I have terms that I have termed assessing. So the first one I would call assess your motivation. This would be like the why, why do it? Uh, it always seems uh, quite uh, flattering or appropriate or timely to go into uh, uh, collaboration. You have this sense of illusion, illusion at the brainstorming phase, right? But um, assessing really your expertise, your investment, and your motivation to go into it is, uh, is crucial. A second one is assess the benefits the very tangible potential benefits for your, C, for your CV. It's probably already part of your motivation. But one very prosaic question would be like, how will this particular project advance my, my career? Uh, beyond uh, networking uh, opportunities, what kind of visibility, what kind of uh, 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 credit is it going to bring me? Um, and, and speaking of credit, I really appreciated the part on, on you know, how you get cited and who gets cited according to the position, because, I mean, according to alphabetical order also. Um, another assess would be assess the, the complexity of the task. It's uh, one thing to collaborate with one person. It's very different to collaborate with 15 or 30 contributors like I, uh, I, I just did. So in other words, try to get as many parameters as, uh, as possible so you can really anticipate uh, possible areas of difficulty, perhaps even impossibilities. The more you can foresee uh, uh, potential, uh, potential issues, uh, the, more, the less they will come as a surprise when, you, when you're into uh, 
the uh, the collaboration. Think about sticking points such as uh, again, you know, uh, differences of power, differences of authority, uh, gender, differences in the, in the, in the writing and researching uh, style, etc. I would also recommend assessing your own practice. Uh, for instance, as, uh, thinking about your level of uh, tolerance with procrastination, whether you're one or whether you're not uh, one, um, how, how um, flexible or nimble are you with, uh, with, uh, with delay, with timing? Uh, what is your level of uh, tolerant, tolerance with uh, feedback and especially honest uh, feedback? You know, are you going to break the relationship? Uh, because of this, consider issues of trust also. And lastly, uh, uh, one issue would be um, timing. Make sure uh, that you have uh, that you don't have anything more urgent uh, to do. In other words, perhaps you have a book to finish, your own book to finish, and especially if you're a junior professor, do you have other projects that maybe you need to 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 finish uh, first? Um, the, 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 the most essential recommendation, again, I have 30 seconds, is get a sense from your chair and your administration about the actual standing, about the actual value of the, the collaborative work you engage with um, before you embark on this uh, adventure. I hope this is helpful and uh, let's uh, just open the floor to uh, further conversation. Thank you so much. Um, I failed to be ruthless, but I inserted myself at, you know, at some point. Yeah, thank you all so much. And, oh, well, I had mine. Um, so uh, thank you, all three. I think that's incredibly useful. Um, please, uh, uh, the floor is open for questions. Do uh, let me know through your raise hand through reactions. Um, I uh, think that uh, you, you guys were all very attentive to the different kinds of collaboration and the different moments. And I want to mention one example that came up in a recent uh, Levan event on collaboration. Uh, we had um, just last month an event on writing as collaboration. And we had a seasoned novelist and uh, his editor of three decades. And then we had two uh, academics who have collaborated a lot with each other and with others, uh, Rainy Daston and Peter Gallison. And one thing that was very interesting to me is that in addition to, of, uh, to talking of the book that they co-wrote, which was a project that took over a decade, uh, what they mentioned is that they met in grad school and they became friends in grad school and that there were three of them that were very close friends in grad school, Peter Gallison, Katie Park and Rainy Daston. And at some point they said, we want to collaborate, but we need uh, single author peer reviewed journal articles. So what they did is they chose a topic that they were all interested in and each of them wrote an article on one aspect of the topic. And I'm talking about a scholar of the medieval period and women and gender and medicine in the medieval period, a scholar of 18th century uh, uh, um, sort of social science, mathematical science probability and a scholar of 20th century physics. So they you would think that it's very hard to collaborate and that collaboration was invisible uh, and it didn't get in the way of them uh, uh, addressing issues of credit that were very, very crucial pragmatically at the time, but they found a way to both collaborate and get credit. Uh, so I thought that was a very uh, clever uh, way to, to address that at a, a specific moment of their career. Um, I see that Sean Fraga has a question. Sean. Yeah, thank you, Daniela, and thank you to the, the three panelists for sharing uh, these thoughts and ideas about collaboration. Um, I'm a postdoc here at USC with the Humanities in a Digital World program, and the digital humanities, of course, often involves collaborative projects uh, that bring together people with different specific technical skills. Um, so I'm at a point now where I, I find it very easy to talk to other historians. I find it relatively easy to talk to other humanists, um, but I'm still sort of struggling to talk to programmers or cartographers or people um, outside of my area of disciplinary training. So I'm curious what advice you have for collaborating with people who work outside of your area of expertise. How do you set up those conversations? How do you how do you make those into productive collaborations? 
I, if it's okay, I can jump in on, on that because I, Sean, I think that's a really great, um, a great point. And I, I think it could, that could come in a few different forms. So I've, I've had moments where I've talked with, especially, you know, sort of system designers and programmers and builders of things where um, we start with just a conversation about what they do without, without any mention of, you know, let's collaborate together or anything, sort of just going into the conversation with a, with a curiosity about their practice and sort of grounding it in it because their practice is what they know and they don't, they're not necessarily motivated by maybe some of the, the academic or sort of research questions that I might be interested in, but they know their practice, they care about their practice. And I, um, borrowing um, a phrase that Don, Don Schoen used years ago, the, the idea of the reflective practitioner is sometimes a, a phrase that has worked when I've been talking with practitioners because most practitioners I think are actually quite reflective. They have thoughts about you know, what they're doing and why they're doing it and just, but they often don't necessarily have a lot of venues or spaces to do that reflection or to take a step back and think about it. So sometimes I framed my, my interactions with them um, as an act of reflection. And, as, and often, and I've done this with journalists as well who are so deadline driven that a lot of times they don't step back and take a, a look at what they do. Um, and sometimes, that, that alone is valuable of just having a conversation where they got a chance to do it. Sometimes in the conversation, we might identify something where we both see um, a little kernel of a puzzle that I view from one perspective and they view from a different perspective, but we sort of, we, we center on that puzzle of, I've had it with journalists sometimes, it's this kind of obvious question where I'll say, how do you decide what to cover? Like, how do, where, where do your stories and some, and then they're like, I never, like, they're like, of course I thought about that, but I also never thought about that. It's that, that they'll, um, so we just try to identify it there. And then in rare, rare circumstances, maybe that progresses to a co-authored or co-jointly, you know, produced thing. Um, but then sometimes it doesn't. And that's, and it's sort of, that's okay too, because they got what they, they wanted from it. So I, I would say like grounding in practices um, and sort of trying to, you know, I'm, I'm looking, I'm not an anthropologist, so I'm not trained in this to, to be able to say this with any uh, expertise, but sort of like almost treat it a little as field work. Like you're, you're, you're having a conversation with them. You're trying to get to know them and do that. And Andy or Nidhi, do you want to come in on this? I mean, just to, to build on what Mike just said about thinking of it as field work and, 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 and imagining somebody who's a technician as an interlocutor who, who gets a chance to reflect on their practice, that's actually become something um, that in cultural anthropology, um, the relationship between the anthropologist and the, and the um, informant has actually come to be thought of as a collaborative relationship in that sense. And that the anthropologist almost can, can sometimes play a therapist type of role of like, okay, so tell me about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And, and so the kind of ethos of practice question becomes a, a vehicle for, for a collaborative relationship. Um, that, that, that does something for each participant. I, um, one thing I would add is that there's, uh, this goes back to something that uh, um, um, I think both Mike and Lidi talked about, but about being very clear about what the collaboration, that particular collaboration uh, entails for you. Right, so sometimes the collaboration is different people bring complementary expertise and you need each other. And so it's a collaboration of uh, need where I will do this part and you will do that part. Uh, uh, and so being very clear about what the needs are and who does what um, and uh, not just credit, but about how that impacts the work. But there's also collaborations of, I would say, um, maybe collaborations of transformation where what you want out of the collaboration is the, what you learn from the other person to change what you yourself uh, um, uh, are doing, right? So just being very clear, I think, about what you are aiming for uh, in that conversation is uh, very, very important. And, um, you always find the limits of collaboration uh, very clearly, right? Uh, it's collaborating uh, is sort of like, uh, you know, walking in a maze and you know when you hit a wall and that you need to take a different direction. Other questions? Margaret, is that a... Tita, sorry. 
Yeah, that's okay. I haven't changed the name up there. Thank you so much for this uh, really wonderful um, discussion. Uh, I think also it's sometimes just important to let the person know that you really would like to, uh, that you care about their discipline and how and important it is for you to uh, have them involved in it. And so just to, uh, you know, co uh, correspond directly with uh, the individual and say that you could profit so much from their particular discipline and could they um, find a way uh, to, to, to do that with you. Um, scholars always like, and practitioners always like to be invited into a collaboration. It's, it's just, uh, they often don't think of it on their own uh, in response to Sean. And uh, another thing, if you were to be involved, for example, in a co-edited volume or a special issue journal um, where you're collaborating with other people on a particular topic, uh, you know, I just encourage you to uh, tell the person who is the editor or the, the lead person in that particular project that you would like to know more about what the other papers are going to be about um, while you are writing, not at the end uh, or just some kind, but that you, that as much as a, a, a scholar who's in the process of writing could make available to the individual people who are involved in a special issue or in or who are involved in a um, co-edited volume or so uh, that you'd like it up front so that you could profit up front from it so that you could all be talking together with each other as much as it's possible of course we're always writing at the last minute and don't know exactly what we're doing but but it is something that is a valid request and it's something that um, i have found very helpful in my own career Thank you, Tita. I um, see hands from both uh, Isaac and Simone, but I don't know who raised it first. Simone, okay. Oh, did I? Okay. Well, Isaac is going like this, so I'm going to. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you, and thank the thank you to the panelists for being here. Um, my question is really process based. I've tried to collaborate in a few different ways, um, like in seminar projects. Um, so I'm curious about the writing process, actually. I've been in collaborations where it's like a back and forth, like I'll write this section and then you read it and then I'll add on my part. I've also tried collaborations where the person wanted to like be on the phone and we're writing it word by word together, which I found very arduous. Um, so I guess the question is like, what were the features of the most functional collaborations you've done? Um, and what would you recommend with regard to like the very specific process stuff? That's a great question. My, I ended by saying, what are also some features of dysfunctional collaboration? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Were you being polite about that? <laughs> okay, so uh, um, anyone, any of the speakers? Yes, I'm happy to pick, uh, to pick up this uh, question. Thank you for your question, Simone. Um, actually, it's, it's, it's very, uh, I, I agree with, with, with Tita and with um, what my colleagues have said about the, the, the need uh, to have a contract, to have a kind of a sense of what you're getting into and what uh, each uh, uh, contributor is going to uh, to bring into the collaboration. And uh, so to take the example of the, the, the book I wrote with a junior colleague, and it's also important that he's a junior colleague, I was a senior colleague. Uh, so we decided we decided on on, on on a method which was going to be okay let's just uh, write like separately and then we'll bring it together and then we'll see what we can do and uh, then we'll rewrite and we'll exchange drafts and everything i can tell you to cut a very long story short that with each chapter we tried a different method uh because it uh, turned out that maybe for chapter number one i had more of an expertise to bring and, uh, and 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 I relied more on him for the narrative part, but maybe for another chapter, it was like the inspiration was completely his and I was more like the, you know, accessory auxiliary in, in the collaboration. So I, my sense is that as much as you want to have a, you know, a, a, a contract that it's as clear as possible, um, you, you, you really go, section by section almost, if not chapter by 
by chapter. There was a way in which, for example, you, you mentioned being on the phone. We were on the phone working the transitions between between paragraph, between sections that we would uh, we would do together. But there was a but the, there's a lot of a trial and uh, and and error, especially when you want to keep your kind of like seamless. Uh, style or tone uh, in the in the final product so it's not a real answer but it's that it's uh, it's 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 almost yeah it's almost section by section uh andy or andy? mike oh. yeah andy did you want to go okay uh I'll jump in really briefly. I, Simone, that's a great question. And um, yeah, the mechanics is where the rubber hits the road sometimes. It's, it's hard to make it work. Um, I, a few things I've had that have gone well. One, I think maybe echoing what Lydia is saying is that I, I, I tend to develop outlines with um, collaborators and just the act of developing the outline and it's iterative and the outline changes and it's just, and it's just, it's out. That's like the hardest work. And then we try to just get more and more detailed in what the outline is doing and then paying attention to the transitions. If we can get transitions between or among um, pieces, then we sort of know what each other's doing. And then we will we'll go through that like assigning um, where it's like both of us have the article or the piece in our heads. And then, but it'll be like, you write that, I'll write this, I'll write this, but we sort of shared, developed a shared uh, way to do it. Another thing I've done with a collaborator uh, that worked really well with, with that one collaborator was, um, we had a rule where basically if somebody changed text, like if somebody, if I edited her text or if she edited my text, you couldn't revert. You could not revert back and say like, I reject your change. I liked my word better. And it, it was kind of this, we didn't, I think we fell into it, but it, it meant then that there, there were kind of some stakes to, to ch like, if I would change her words, I kind of knew that I had a, like an implicit budget of how much change I could do before it got awkward and then vice versa. And then she wouldn't revert back. Um, so that was a that was a kind of thing uh, we did. We also did um, with another collaborator. I did um, actually with with Kate Crawford, who's who's now coming to USC. We did a thing where we were we were looking at a whole bunch of interview transcripts together, and we were writing an article based on it. And we it was at a coffee shop, and we sat there both with the same interview text in front of us. And the the interview the quotes were way too long to be able to you know put in. The text that we were developing. So we did a little thing where we both would focus on like, how would you excerpt that interview? Like what parts of that text would you bring? And then I would do the same. And then we had these wonderful moments where we start, we would discover like, why did you make that excerpt versus that excerpt in the interview? And then we talk about it, but it became a concrete um, thing of how we excerpted interviews. And then the last thing I'll say is I loathe writing in Google Docs. I can't do it. I really hate it. It's like, I hate because my my eye goes to the top right hand corner of like and if somebody is like in the document while I'm writing, freaks me out. Can't do it. I I will so I'll like copy and paste stuff into a Word doc and privately write and then I'll put it back in the Google doc. But so that but that's just I know that for myself that it's like can't can't do the Google doc writing for that stuff. Um. I mean, one thing I would take from both what Lydia and, and Mike said that I think is really true is that each, you know, each collaboration is bespoke. I mean, it's like you have to customize it each time and figure out that you know, between the, the personalities, the kind of project you're doing, what is the right technology, what is the right form of interaction. Um, Mike, I actually also hate Google Docs, and I, I wrote it, you know, a long book with a collaborator on Word Docs, just like these lengthy commentaries, and we have this, it is, it gets into the dysfunctional, of course, because there's lots of exchanges that can go on that way, but um, I guess the point is really, you know, you have to negotiate it and, and, and that trust is really critical um, and, and that, you know, you have to trust that your collaborators, um, you have to sort of give them some, some room and they have to give you room too, um, as well as being willing to, to be quite frank when you think mm -hmm. something is not the right direction. If I may add also, because I, I have my junior colleague in mind and he's actually coming uh, for tenure now, and, and this is you know one item on his CV, uh, they asked him to um, to just to prove that the the co-authoring was more than half plus half. So thankfully he had kept all the drafts and the correspondence and stuff, and he's actually printing out or back and forth and you know versions of the the drafts with the comments and stuff to show that you know the 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 total was more than the than the sum of the parts so it's also important to be able to mm. document these uh, 
Hmm. That's sort of amazing and a little bit terrifying, Lily, <laughs> to imagine those exchanges. And Isaac, you've been very patient. Oh, no. Uh, thank you. I, I'm finding this really uh, generative and, and useful. Um, I'm wondering uh, the extent to which you see or approach collaboration as itself uh, political, uh, insofar as collaboration has the potential to <clears throat> sort of reveal the dialogic, intersubjective, unequal, uh, partial uh, that's inherent to you know, much knowledge production. And thus collaboration would seem to have um, uh, a sort of fundamental uh, political stakes in like, destabilizing or interrogating the boundaries um, drawn by like hegemonic uh, knowledge formations. So I guess um, Professor uh, Mudaleno sort of um, uh, gestured in this direction, but I'm just wondering if you can kind of tarry with the political possibilities of collaboration uh, explicitly. Maybe I will start if uh, while everybody, everybody is nodding very seriously. I pasted on the chat a quote from the museum scholar uh, Ivan Karp. Uh, uh, that he uh, gave at a lecture and that has become sort of a statement that is repeated often in museum studies uh, literature, which is collaboration is an opportunity to fail in the most splendid way. And the context in which he made that is uh, projects in which museum uh, curators and museum staff collaborated with communities uh, precisely for the uh, political stakes. Uh, of bringing community members as part of exhibition process, uh, projects of uh, destabilizing their own authority. And what they found was that these were very productive collaborations, but they did not uh, often lead to the kinds of results that uh, they would have wanted or expected. Uh, and that because so much conflict was generated, so many, there were more sort of sticking points than not. And uh, those uh, they uh, characterize as productive failures, right? As things that uh, may not lead to an exhibition or changing of the world text uh, or the participation of the community in, in a certain way, but that uh, allowed them to generate very, very important change. So he was being uh, sort of um, not facetious in calling it failure, uh, but that the, uh, the rub was where the, the important insights were. Um, Mike, Andy, uh, Lidi. I'll give you one example. Um, and. Uh, I, I believe it is political because it has to do with bringing uh, visibility and increasing um, kind of the, in the intellectual uh, relevance, or at least showcasing the intellectual relevance of, of, of disciplines that might be uh, called uh, minor uh, disciplines of kind of like increasing uh, uh, the, vi the visibility of the, of the small numbers. And I think of, uh, for example, a grant that I that I wrote when I was uh, when I was back at Penn for um, for Title Nine uh, for Title Nine grant in African studies, and there weren't enough Africanists uh, on my campus, uh, and we found we you know a kind of like community outside of my institution find the solution of applying for this grant as a consortium in other, in other words stepping out of our uh, universities not only of our disciplines but stepping out of our, our universities to bring together five different uh, institutions or five different institutions with two africanists in in one but resulting in a, in, a, in a very powerful consortium, consortium uh, generating the, the 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 visibility of african studies in a certain region so i think of it as a as a political uh, act of uh, for solidarity between colleagues but also uh, um, a kind of efficient way of uh, calling, uh, rallying uh, numbers to gain uh, uh, the presence of a discipline on a given uh, campus. Others, if you think about that USC, you know, when you want to put it, when you want to invite somebody, when you want to put together an event, the administration likes 
the fact that it's co-sponsored. In other words, that other you can show that other people have interest in a particular topic, perhaps because the topic is too is could be deemed too too minor if it stays within one uh, one one administrative unit or department. I, and I think it's also part of like the the proactive way of going stepping outside and finding uh, solidarities outside. Thank you, Mike. Did you want to come in on this, or can we? Or yeah, I'll be super yes. fast in it, but because I, I echo what, what Lydia said, but also say and also say um, in these interdisciplinary sort of multi institutional things, I, I would be conscious sometimes of how you are being read by either people who are funding a collaboration or people who want a collaboration to happen. I've been in circumstances where, especially in communication where I've been sort of, you know, head tiltingly curious, like they will read you as almost like either a service role. So I've, I've been in moments where somebody's like, well, you do communication, help us, help us do the public messaging on the research we want to do. And then you do the like, package it up in a PR style fashion. And I'm like, that's not what I do. I don't, I don't know how to do the job. So just be conscious sometimes of like how you can get co-opted or brought into, um, uh, a role, I guess, that maybe is is beyond what you're, uh, you know, what you're actually doing. Thank you. Uh, Pamela is uh, next. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I'd be curious, I think, to know a little bit more about some of the translation work. Um, so again, kind of like returning to this question that we were asking earlier about process um, that's involved in collaborations. So like how decisions are made when you run across um, words that are you know very disciplinary bound or in some cases like jargon etc Lidi, i think this one was for you oops sorry i I'm, i mentioned the translation because uh, because actually i had in mind a recent case where um, a graduate student had uh, translated a, a, a chapter for a volume and, and it would be interesting also to, to think about the, the collaboration between faculty and graduate student because we don't call it collaboration uh, because we actually pay them to do work for us, but it, it is collaboration. Anyway, um, I had a very hard time uh, um, accept, uh, convincing, I didn't actually convince the editors to, um, to list the graduate student as author, as the, as the author of a translation. So in other words, you know, I really uh, insisted that uh, the, the translator be an author and, and, and that it be credited to her as, a, as, an, as, a, as an item uh, of her own. But uh, I have to say that this was tw in 2019 and they did not accept the fact that, uh, that uh, a piece of translation was uh, done by an author. So I, I uh, uh, use this example to uh, to state that there's still work to be done to acknowledge some of the collaborative work as uh, work and as work that should be credited to uh, to authors. I don't know if that answers your question, but that but that's why I mentioned uh, translation and the need to, to write kind of the invisible. Uh, Thank you. And I, I will mention also that uh, translation is uh, sometimes a solitary sort of single authored activity and sometimes it's done in workshops. And I am thinking of the translation workshop that uh, Barbara Fuchs runs at UCLA, uh, where grad students and faculty collaborate on translating uh, uh, Spanish Golden Age theater into English. And it's all done in a workshop. So uh, those models exist. Uh, uh, Tita, I think you get the very last question, perhaps. Oh, so I don't I don't want to take that role, but I'll just take uh, I'll say a couple quick things about translation. I think uh, uh, in my past, I uh, translated a lot and um, there was a grant that was offered by the NEH, um, which was precisely for, uh, which I received, which was precisely for collaboration in translation. And so we received it as two people and it allowed us to do, you know, a 400, 500 page book together from two different disciplines. So the thing I wanted to say very quickly is that um, when I was hearing about the political, I would say that, the, that what needs to happen 
at all the ranks of uh, the academia is to put pressure on our individual associations um, and to have them understand that what, in my case, Modern Language Association, in your case, there will be, you know, in social sciences, there might be an, another one, but to understand that the kind of collaborative work that is going on anyway within academia and that they've all, you know, um, approved on some levels intellectually really needs to be called attention to as a political um, uh, move on the part of of, uh, of all of us to um, make it a, to institute systemic changes within the institutions or academic institutions so that collaboration um, becomes recognized at all levels of tenure, of uh, promotion and so forth. It has to happen, it has to happen from us, from the senior scholars, but it also, um, the junior scholars insofar as, you know, uh, of just showing this is the work we do anyway. This is the work that we've been asked to do to become intellectually expansive. So now we need to institute in, um, changes. And so certain granting institutions have followed that recommendation, but we really need to do much more work on that level. Andy, did you want to come in on that? Thank you, Tita, that is super important. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it's kind of building on what Tita said and also um, Isaac's question about the politics of collaboration, especially when it involves bringing in multiple authors who are not usually, you know, powerful um, institutional figures. And I, I guess I would just also call for ref reflection on our part about why it has been in the humanistic social sciences and the humanities that the single author model is kind of the, the, the way that authoritative knowledge production occurs in the form of narrative that is generated by the single author and the, the, the kind of a, the kind of voice that we expect from an author and that you know we're all kind of, we've all kind of participated and been trained in that mode um, and we would have to actually kind of rethink what what authoritative knowledge looks like if we're going to bring in multiple voices um, and that's a, that's actually a, a big um, it's a big task and, and and so it's you know it's it's not just the deans and the, the scholarly associations but it's sort of ourselves and what we think counts as serious knowledge I think we are at the end of our hour. Thank you so much to the uh, three speakers who offered their thoughts and experience today. I think they were very humble in not talking a lot about the collaborations that they have themselves participated in, but that they are all inveterate, uh, uh, unrepentant uh, collaborators. And thank you all for your questions and contribution. Uh, we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you.